Good morning. Our reading today is 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 15. <clears throat> but this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. For every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. As it is written, He hath dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. Now, he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food, and multiply your seed sown, and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causeth uh, through us thanksgiving to God. For the administration of this service not only supplieth the want of the saints, but is abundant also by many thanksgivings unto God. Whilst by the experiment of this ministration, they glorify God for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ and for your liberal distribution unto them and to all men. And by their prayer for you, which long after you for the exceeding grace of God in you. Thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. Let's pray together. Father, it would be uh, appropriate at this point for me to come before you and offer thanksgiving for all the things that you have done for us and given to us for the life that we live and the comforts that we enjoy, but it's, we really don't even, if we lived our whole life praising you, we would never cover everything you've done for us. Please let it su suffice today to simply acknowledge that all good comes from you, and we have experienced much good through you. Father, I ask you to take our offerings this morning as thank yous for the good that you've given us, and uh, use them for the benefit of your kingdom and for your glory. I pray all this in Jesus' name, amen.
morning that song the eye his eyes on the sparrow kind of messes my makeup up i don't know about anybody else but it always gets to me <laughs> all right this first poem that i wrote expresses how god sends messages of love through different ways and the second one expresses how we should be mindful of god's protection over us against scammers and fraud god sent us a love letter it was wrapped in a gray cloud and sealed with a kiss of rain. It arrived special delivery straight to our hearts. We knew it was coming, we just didn't know when. It was scented with the fragrance of a gentle rain that filled the dry well of our souls, written with loving words that resonated on our ears like the pitter-patter of abundant droplets dancing on the dry, dusty ground. What did your love letter from God say to you? Or maybe you're still waiting for yours. God hasn't forgotten you. He loves you no matter what, and your love letter will come. My prayer for this crazy world. It's a technologically confusing world nowadays, especially if you remember a simpler time with party lines and single-digit birthdays. We should pray for protection over our interests against fraud and scammers each day. Like hungry wolves, they're always ready to pounce on their prey. May God protect us as we drive down the street for the alertness of others that they drive and not tweet. We ask that if we should blunder or fall, that hidden cameras aren't recording at all. And as we self-check out at the store, may our purchases all be accounted for, nothing less, nothing more. Thus we give thanks for our shield against hatred and fraud. Evil has no match for him, our almighty, all-knowing, all-powerful God. That was awesome. It's wonderful that we can use our unique skills to glorify God, isn't it? I hope you uh, are using your skills in similar ways. Uh, at this point, we can go ahead and dismiss our kids for Children's Church. I hope you'll be praying for the Children's Church workers who um, put in a lot of hours both for Children's Church while I'm on the platform and in Sunday school. Also for those who work in the nursery. Uh, there's laying that foundation that hopefully will stand strong for all the life of those kids. So I, I pray that you will be uh, uh, aware of that important ministry and keep that in your prayers on a daily basis. Uh, speaking of prayer at this point, before we look into the Word of God ourselves, please bow with me and we'll ask for God's blessing. Father, I want to thank you for the privilege we have of studying your word. I'm well aware of the fact that uh, not just as a human being, but as me personally, there are limitations that keep me from expressing it in perfection. I don't think any human being can truly delve to the depths of your word. We need your spirit's guidance. And his voice in our life to help us to do that. Father, as we look into this passage today, I just ask you to make it clear what you want us to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to the holiday season. Anybody feeling more stressed yet? Um, Holiday season's busy time, and there's other stresses that go with the holiday season. Uh, we're going to start uh, next week. We're going to have a message on Thanksgiving, and then the Thanksgiving holiday is the following week. I can't believe that it's caught up with us so quickly. Uh, I hope you have plans for the holidays. I hope that they are a blessing to you. But sometimes the holidays get a little stressful, don't they? Especially in that area of generosity. I think generosity, to be honest with you, if you think about it in the right way, may be the most stressful aspect of the holidays. 
I mean, we want to focus on the holidays for the right reasons, especially as believers in Jesus Christ. We want to approach Thanksgiving Day with a, a thankful heart and the, the opportunity to express our gratitude for all the blessings we have from God. When Christmas Day comes, we want to focus on the birth of Jesus Christ. When New Year's Day comes, we want to, to praise God for the, the new beginnings that He gives us. As the Scripture says, His mercies are new every morning. And the beginning of a new year is just a time to focus on that. But then we get into that concept of giving. And I think that sometimes that may be the most stressful part of this holiday season. We want, we want to put on the perfect Thanksgiving meal. We want to give the perfect gifts to all the people we care for. We, we want New Year's Day to be a, a perfect reunion with the family members. And if you're uh, anything like one of my favorite characters from fiction, this may surprise you, but I happen to enjoy sitcoms. And I watch uh, the, the sitcom Big Bang Theory. I don't know if you've heard of that or watched it. It's, it's irrelevant. There's a character in there, um, Sheldon Cooper, who is, uh, to say the least, neurotic. And he's got a problem with Christmas. Uh, he's got this issue with Christmas and gift giving. He, he's, he's, he reads into gift giving some kind of a social contract where he is, if he receives a gift, he's obligated to give an equal or greater gift back. And it gets him into some very humorous situations where he's trying to predict what people are giving or, or um, match their giving in some way so that it's equal and he doesn't have to keep going through the one-upsmanship of, of gift giving. Now, hopefully none of us are as neurotic as Sheldon Cooper would be, but I do believe we feel that pressure, don't we? We feel that pressure to keep up with the Joneses, so to speak, in the way we, we give or we, we host different events. And unfortunately, in our country, we have the opportunity to uh, not use cash, but to use that little piece of plastic that the bank is so willing to give us so that we can charge what we buy and spend the next, in some cases, they calculate it for 25 years paying for it. I wouldn't recommend you get that card, okay? But it does raise the stress for the rest of the year. Now we've got a bill that we have to keep paying every month for the rest of the year, and that, that leads to anxiety, which rubs off on our, our partners, and we get that marital strife that uh, every divorce attorney will tell you that finances has something to do with almost every divorce, it just ruins the whole year. So how are we to look at giving and being generous as we approach this holiday season? And how can we keep the stress of it from taking away from the holidays? Well, we're going to look at how David did it. We're going to be in 1 Chronicles chapter 29 for the bulk of this morning, if you want to turn there. We're going to see how David, who was probably the most self-sufficient man in his era, how he recognized joy and secured joy in his giving. Now, to understand what's going on in this passage, we have to set the context. Frequently, that's the case. In this case, we have to go uh, all the way back to chapter 22 to begin setting the context. The context is all built around this building that David wanted to build, and God told him he couldn't, and God told him Solomon would build, who is David's son. So David's getting old, and back in chapter 22, David is um, kind of moving into retirement, it's not something kings usually did in that day and age, but he wanted to move into retirement and give Solomon the chance to kind of administrate the kingdom without carrying all the responsibility. And so he's giving a speech to Solomon in chapter 22, and he's encouraging him to be ready to build this temple. I, I looked at uh, several lists this week, and this temple is actually on several, there, there's not an official list, but there's several lists of the 
the seven wonders or the eight wonders of the ancient world. And this, this temple was actually on several of them. It was an amazing building. And David is encouraging Solomon with the work that he's going to have to be doing. And in uh, chapter 22, verse 14, David is passing on to Solomon the administration of the kingdom. And he's saying in the treasury, there's a certain number of resources that are set aside for the building of this temple. And we read in verse 14 of chapter 22, uh, with great pains I have provided for the house of the Lord 100,000 talents of gold and a million talents of silver. So this is a government money that David is instructing Solomon to set aside. And if you're like me, that word talent means absolutely nothing. I have no idea what 10,000 talents of gold is. So I looked it up. Uh, some of you will have a little footnote in the bottom of your, the page of your Bible where it will say that a talent is about 75 pounds. So I took the, the 100,000 talents, multiplied it by 75 to get the number of pounds, and then I multiplied it by 16 to get the number of ounces. And then uh, it was on October the 14th when I did this. I went to the uh, Treasury Department's website and found out what gold was selling for that day. And it was selling for $1,652 an ounce. So I did the math, and the government was contributing $198,348,000 worth of gold for the temple. So there's several other speeches in between until we get to chapter 29. And now David is speaking to the whole nation. He's speaking to all the leaders and the government officials and rich people in his country. And in uh, chapter 29, verse 3, David says, Moreover, in addition to all that I have provided for the holy house, I have a treasury of my own of gold and silver. And because of my devotion to the house of my God, I give it to the house of my God. 3,000 talents of gold, the gold of Ophar, and 7,000 talents of refined silver. Now, I don't like to do math, so I'm sticking with the gold in this, okay? 3,000 talents of gold. That's $6,849,108,000 worth of gold. Then at the end of verse 5, he says, Who then will offer willingly, consecrating themselves today to the Lord? He's challenging the rest of the people to give. It says they gave 500, I'm sorry, 5,000 talents of gold and 10,000 darics of gold. That's a, a smaller measurement. And then he talks about the silver and also. Look, look at the value of this gold now. 9 billion 915,529,750 worth of gold from the people. I added that together. I had to write all this down because I can't remember these numbers, okay? I added that together and got 315,112,637,750 worth of gold alone in the temple. That's a big number, and it's kind of hard for us to grasp how big that is. So I went one step further, and I went and looked at the reserves in Fort Knox, the United States Official Gold Reserve. On the same day, they only had $152,038,939 worth of gold. Almost 3,000 times less gold in our reserve than was dedicated to the building of this temple. This is not a little thing. This is huge. The value and the sacrifice and the um, just magnificence of what was donated just to cover the walls with gold. We see David's response to it in verse 10. It says, Therefore, David blessed the Lord in the presence of all the assembly, and David said, Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our, of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. 
Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. But who am I, and what is my people, that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you, and of your own have we given you. For we are strangers before you, and sojourners as all our fathers were. Our days on earth are like a shadow, and there is no abiding. O Lord our God, all this abundance that we have provided for building you a house for your holy name comes from your hand, and it is all your, your own. I know, my God, that you test the hearts and have pleasure in uprightness. In the uprightness of my heart, I have freely offered all these things. And now I have seen your people who are present here offering freely and joyously to you. O oh Lord, our God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers, keep forever such purposes and thoughts in the hearts of your people and direct their hearts toward you. Grant to Solomon, my son, a whole heart that, will make, that he may keep your commandments and your testimonies and your statutes, performing all, and that he may build the palace for which I have made provision. Then David said to all the assembly, Bless the Lord your God. And all the assembly blessed the Lord, the God of their fathers, and bowed their heads and paid homage to the Lord and to the king. And they offered sacrifices to the Lord. And on the next day, offered burnt offerings to the Lord, 1,000 bulls, 1,000 rams, and 1,000 lambs with their drink offerings and sacrifices in abundance for all Israel. And they ate and drank before the Lord on that day with great gladness, and they made Solomon the son of David king the second time. And they anointed him as prince for the Lord and Zadok as the priest." It's amazing to watch what's happening here as you, you read through this and, and break down what David is actually saying and how the people are responding. This tremendous abundance has been given, something that we can't wrap our minds around. And David responds with a prayer, first acknowledging the things God didn't give. The things God retains for himself. We see things in this list like greatness and power and glory and victory and majesty. All things that, from an earthly perspective, David could have claimed for himself, he recognizes God has the only right to claim. And I think that's wise. When you get all those things, you end up accumulating power. And David never acknowledged himself or never accepted for himself the claim of great power. That always belonged to God. I think David may have heard that proverb that we use. Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Did you ever notice that that's not true? It's not. Power does not corrupt. From the minute the human race kicked God off of planet earth in the garden, the human heart has been corrupt ever since then. All power does is give the corruption an opportunity to ventilate itself, to express itself. And that's why God keeps for himself the majesty and the victory and the power. And we are to see him as the one who possesses that in order to keep our hearts from expressing the corruption that we've inherited from our ancestors. But David moves on from there very quickly in verse 12. He begins to talk about the things that God has given, the things that David rejoices in and praises God for, things like riches and honor, 
greatness and strength that God has given to David because David was a man after God's own heart and used those things for God's glory. In fact, if you read the whole Bible, you'll see that it was actually David who wanted to build this temple. And he was told by God not to. Some people have taken that as an opportunity to criticize David. I think that was just God pointing out right, uh, right responsibilities. The rest of the nations around Israel were still strong enough to invade and uh, raid the riches of Israel. And if they'd collected all this gold together in one place, if David hadn't secured the borders, it had just been stolen. And so David's role was to make security so that his son would be able to create prosperity. And as you read the whole Bible, you'll see that's what happened. But the bulk of this passage isn't about David. It's about the people. It's about the people's relationship and how they responded to this call to build this temple that would eventually make the list of the wonders of the ancient world. We see thanksgiving in verse 13. And we see humility in verse 14. We see David acknowledging that everything they have comes from God anyway. He must have been thinking about the, the passage where Moses said, when you enter the land, be careful when you prosper when you live in houses you didn't build, when you drink from sisters you didn't dig, when you, when you prosper, don't think that it was your strength that made you wealthy. For it's God who gives the ability to work and the ability to amass wealth. And David is responding to passages like that. If it wasn't for God, I never could have done this. And then... Don't, you got to read it slow sometimes. But then, in the, in the, the, towards the middle of this passage, verse um, 21, he says, And they offered sacrifices to the Lord, and on the next day offered burnt offerings. So they've given all this gold, now they're given other sacrifices. And then the next day, they offer a thousand bulls, a thousand rams, and a thousand lambs. If you study the, the Levitical offerings, these are offered as burnt offerings, so they're not whole burnt, they're not everything's being burnt, only the parts that really aren't edible are being burnt on the altar, and the rest of it is a barbecue. I always thought Texans invented barbecue, but I think the Jews beat them to it. And they had a big party, they celebrated God's generosity and their ability to be generous back. And they go ahead and reconfirm um, Solomon as king. I think there's a little bit more to that when you read it contextually. You read uh, that would be David stepping back a little bit more from the rule and giving Solomon a little bit more power. In essence, saying, okay, I'm still alive, but you go ahead. You've got the resources now. Start working on the temple. And so they confirm Solomon's call to be the next king, and they appoint a priest to lead worship when the temple is built. They rejoiced, they celebrated, and then they got busy building the temple. Now, what I want to focus on today, there's a lot of lessons in this, but what I want to focus on today is the emphasis in this passage that God is the one who gives the opportunity to be generous. God is the one who gives us the wherewithal financially and the opportunity in time to be generous to others. And since God has been so generous with us, we can react in similar ways to the people in David's time. I mean, think about it. If this caused David, this immense generosity called, caused David to praise God, and if that caused the people to praise God for the great blessings he'd given and the great opportunities coming in the future, then it should also cause us to praise God for our spiritual history all the way back to the temple and before, for the opportunities we have today to be generous. Not just 
when the offering bag goes around in the church or for missions offerings, but even things like Christmas gifts. We have to remember that it's God who gives us that opportunity. Now, if we take the whole scripture, which is kind of my catchphrase, you know, read the whole Bible. If you read the whole Bible, we can take what we've learned from David today and learn from the rest of the Bible things like how to be generous. And the past, one passage, key passage was read already for us this morning. In 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 through 15, we learn that God loves a cheerful giver. In that passage, it says that each person is to give what he has determined in his own heart to give. I think that's an amazing concession from God. If you look at the Old Testament and you read through the whole Old Testament and you add up all the tithes that they were told to give, it's somewhere around, it's a little bit less, but it's somewhere around 30% of their income. They were to give a tithe to the temple, a tithe to the Levites, and a tithe to the government. Now, some of that was year by year so, or every other year, so it wasn't quite 30%, but it's still a lot more than the 10% that the evangelical church in the United States preaches. But Paul didn't say give 10%. Two things come out of that in my mind. One is we live in the most prosperous country in the history of the world. Sometimes, not every time, but sometimes people use that 10% as a cop-out because they really could give more. The other thing that stands out to me is that we are to give with joy. God loves a cheerful giver. If we're giving so much, now listen, this applies more than just to the church. It applies to Christmas gifts or the big holiday Thanksgiving meal. If we're spending more on that than gives us joy, if we're giving, spending so much on that that it causes us stress and anxiety, then maybe we're doing it to be impressive to people instead of to God. So what does it mean to be a cheerful giver? Sometimes it's easier to understand these phrases if we imagine explaining it to a five-year-old. This is how I explained it to a five-year-old one time. They said, how much should I give? Daddy gave me a dollar. How much should I give? Well, most of us would say 10 cents, right? Daddy gave me a dollar. You give so much it makes you giggle. If you have joy in your giving, your face should know it, right? It should make you giggle. It should be such a joy to you. Give you so much peace. And, and, and help you see the value of God and what he's given you, that it should make you giggle. When was the last time you gave until you giggled? Not only do we learn how we should give, but we learn when we should give. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 17, it says, how can you claim the, Lord, the love of God is in your life if you have the resources and you see your brother in need and you don't meet that need. John is telling us that we should give when we see needs. I had the opportunity this last week to drive through Oklahoma City. And when I drove to a certain intersection, I knew what was going to happen. There's a panhandler on all four corners. And I, I've seen them there before and to be honest with you, I came home with the same amount of money as I left with. Now, this is me, okay? But it just gives you an idea of how I look at needs in situations like that. There's two things that I look for. I look at their hair. And somebody standing on that corner with the sign that says, need help to feed my kids, and they've got a $50 haircut, then I'm probably going to let them get their help from somebody else. People who are really in need don't have $50 haircuts. They don't have $10 haircuts. People who are in need cut their own hair. And you can tell. The other thing I look, I look at is uh, what I learned from the Waltons. Anybody remember the Waltons? The TV show back in the 70s and 80s where uh, they're going through the Great Depression 
In one of the episodes, there was a nearby family who had been wealthy before the Great Depression, and they still lived in the great house, and they still had fancy clothes, but they stopped inviting people to their house. And the community assumed that they were being snobbish. But one of the Walton boys corrected that. He said, no, they're not being snobbish. They're proud. They don't have any more money, and they don't want us to know. And he said, well, how do you know? He said, look at their shoes. He says, they can keep their clothes looking nice, but their shoes are wearing out, and they're not replacing them. And that one lady on that one corner would have gotten some money probably from me if she wasn't wearing a brand new pair of Nikes. White, brand new Nikes. You can say to me, but pastor, maybe she got that down at the, the Union Mission or somewhere, and they, somebody gave that to her. Well, I said, yeah, that's possible, but if she's having her needs met there, I don't see a need. Now, I'm not asking anybody to, to emulate what I've just said. I'm just giving that as an illustration that you can use your wisdom to see a need. But when you do see the need, the Bible asks you to meet it. We give joyfully, and we give to meet needs. As we read the rest of the Bible, we also see the outcome of being generous. We should reap bountifully, the Bible says. Well, just so you're comfortable with me now, I am not preaching a prosperity gospel. I am not promising that if you give $10 to this church, God is going to give you $100 back. That is not biblical. People who preach that form of the gospel and me do not get along. I've gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with a couple of them, and I will go toe-to-toe -to -toe every chance I get because you're promising something God didn't promise. But God did say you would reap bountifully. He said we would reap the joy, not the anxiety, not the stress, but joy. The other benefit the other outcome of being generous people is we get to see God glorified. Because when genuine needs are met, God gets the glory. People will praise God. The, the people who receive the blessing will praise God for your generosity. The angels will praise God for the generosity of the church. You will be able to say to God, I'm just a humble servant and did what you put in front of me. God gets the glory. Now, all that said, I got one more thing to add. There are people in this room, uh, somebody told me, I always assume when there's more than 10 people in the room, one of them can benefit from what I'm about to say. You have the opportunity this morning to respond to God's epitome of generosity. God's highest demonstration of generosity. You have the opportunity to benefit from God's infinite grace. All it takes is to acknowledge that God exists. The Bible says that if we, don't, if, if we want to please God, we have to admit that He exists. So we acknowledge that He exists. The second is to realize that the human heart is corrupt already. That when Adam and Eve ate the fruit, if you read it carefully, you'll see that they thought they were going to become gods. They were going to kick God off of planet Earth. And ever since then, all of us have had that corruption. And we need a Redeemer. And we have to consider Jesus, the one who redeems us and brings us into a better relationship, a right relationship with God. And then all we have to do is hold our hands out and say, God, please, can I have that? Because he wants to give it as a gift. He wants to demonstrate his generosity by giving you this gift that only Jesus could purchase. Only Jesus, by being perfect and going to the cross and paying the price that all of us have to eventually pay, the death of our body, will 
open the door for us to have eternal life with God, with Jesus' as Father, and abundant life from here into eternity. We have to receive it by faith. We have to trust him when he says he's going to give it to us. Now, if that is the expression of your heart, then all you have to do now is express that to Jesus. Express it to God. Simply talk to him. That's We use the fancy word prayer, but just talk to him. Say, God, I know you're there. I know I need you. I know Jesus is the only one who can fix my problem. Please give it to me. And every time, God will say yes. You may have questions about that, and I'll be around afterward to answer those if you have questions. But please don't leave here without receiving the greatest expression of generosity this world has ever seen. And for everyone else, as you approach the holiday season, if you want to keep that season in the right focus, we have to remember God's generosity and take advantage of the opportunities to replicate it. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for your word and its clarity and its easy access for us. I thank you for the, the honesty in your word where some of it is a great story of triumph in, in spiritual things, and some of it is failure. I want to thank you for the story of David and all the ups and downs his life experienced. And at the end of his life, he wanted to see you glorified. Father, help us to emulate that, to see the great things that Jesus has done for us to emulate him and to share it with others so that you get the glory. Help us to be generous with what we know and what we have. I ask for all of it in Jesus' name. Amen.